This video is brought to you by Mint Mobile. So this is Samsung's Galaxy Z Fold 5 and I've been using it for the last two months now since it came out. And I always have a love-hate relationship with Z Folds or just foldables in general. I always feel like once I start using them again, I, I can't switch away. And then once I switch off, I don't have the urge to wanna to switch back. And right now I'm in that period where I don't wanna switch off this phone. I just love the Galaxy Z Fold 5. The experience that it gives you is phenomenal. So first, we got the build and design. It's actually reminiscent of the previous Fold devices. They haven't fully changed too much, especially coming from the Fold 4, but there's some small improvements here and there. So the number one thing is gonna be the camera bump. It's just a little bit differently designed. It's a little bit less thick as the camera bump, but the lenses do stick out a little bit more and they moved that flash module from being on the actual camera bump to now being built into the back of the display. So cases from previous Z Fold 4s aren't gonna fit perfectly, or they will fit perfectly, but they are gonna cover up that flash camera. Another thing to note is that the Z Fold 5's gap has been decreased dramatically compared to last year. You still can see through it if you're looking very closely, like if I put it up against my eye, you can, you can clearly see the display on the inside and almost see through <laughs> if you're looking through it. But um, if you use a case, that gap just completely disappears. Besides that, the phone has an armor aluminum frame on the outside and it's been holding up decently. I do have a few scuffs here and there, very minor scuffs and scratches on the aluminum armor when I did a drop test. And then I also have a cracked lens on my one of my cameras. And so far the hinge has been holding up just fine. I don't hear any cracking yet. Also feels very smooth overall as well. And it still opens up pretty much fully. And in the back glass, it is a matte finish and it is Corning Gorilla Glass Victus 2. So it is a matte finish all around, both on the frame and on the back glass itself. And this is a Samsung exclusive colorway. I believe it's the blue colorway, but I believe they have a black, a light gray exclusive colorway. And then they have, I think a beige and then a sky blue, like an icy blue, slightly lighter blue compared to this blue that I have here. I personally really like this two-tone look, but overall the build itself maybe is a slightly bit slimmer because the hinge has reduced a little bit in size and the phone has lost a little bit of weight. It feels pretty comfortable in the hand. It does have a good grip because the armor aluminum frame has a matte finish and then the corners are kind of flushed out or softened out so it's not like a sharp corner at all. So I would still recommend a case overall just to add a little bit of grippiness. You can get something like the Samsung case which comes with an S Pen if you want to. It is more on the slimmer side which I like so if you just want something low key then this would do justice but also keep in mind that because the phone is affordable it is a little bit thicker so some external accessories or third-party accessories that you may use may not work fully functional with this type of phone especially if it's made for a regular slab phone especially then if you add a case it may make it even more difficult for you to use those accessories so definitely keep that in mind as well if you're coming from a regular slab phone next looking at the buttons and ports and other small specs here and there and the Z Fold 5 has dual firing speakers, both one on the top and one at the bottom, and they sound pretty good overall to me. Great for watching videos, great for listening to music if you want to listen to music every now and then. You do have USB-C at the bottom for charging and data transfer. Then you have your power button and your volume rocker on the one side, and you also have a physical SIM card slot. And as far as connections and services, I personally have had little to like no issues with services. Wi-Fi has been running just fine. Bluetooth connections have been running just fine as well. As far as my data connections and services, I've had little to no issues with my service. And I've actually been using Mint Mobile who I'm partnering with for this video. And when they reached out to partner with me, I was more than excited because I've been a Mint Mobile customer for the last like two and a half years. So when I tell you their service is good, I'm telling you their service is good because I've been using the service for quite a while. So if you ever thought to yourself, why the is my bill so damn high? Well, let me tell you about Mint Mobile. You, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't. Maybe you've seen their ads with Ryan Reynolds. They're pretty funny if you haven't seen them before. Definitely look them up. But let me tell you about their service. They offer plans as low as $15 a month and you don't have to sacrifice speed, coverage, or data because they're built on the nation's largest 5G network. And they're actually able to keep costs so low because they actually don't have physical stores. They don't hire physical salespeople. Everything is just done online. They sell directly to you from there. So why would you pay more than you have to to access the same network? It doesn't make sense to me. So if you're interested and want to save big on premium wireless, check the link down in the description or scan the QR code right now on the screen. I've actually switched myself and like I said, everyone else in my family to Mint Mobile over the past two years and everyone's been enjoying it. You know, parents on Facebook, me on YouTube, browsing the internet, my sister on her TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram and social media, 
everyone's been having a great experience so far. And in fact, Mint Mobile actually offers a modern family plan with up to two lines, which is actually what my family does. And switching to Mint Mobile is super easy as well. It takes like 15 minutes to pay as little as $15 a month. It's super simple. And they have actual eSIM cards if you want to use an eSIM or if your phone is incompatible with an eSIM, they do have physical SIM cards as well that you can get shipped out for free. And right now, through the end of October, they actually have a special limited time offer where they're offering the unlimited plan, which is usually like $30 a month for $15 a month. So use my link, trymintmobile.com slash taco tech or use the link down in the description or scan a QR code as you please to sign up for Mint Mobile. It genuinely does help out the channel. And if you made the switch, Please let me know down in the comments how it went for you. And as far as the haptics, I think they're pretty okay. They're not the best haptics out there in the world, but they get the job done. So when you're typing around, it feels pretty nice. Swiping gestures, it feels good. I don't think it's the best. When you have it set the whole way up, somewhere in the middle, I think, is the nice happy medium in my opinion. Now talking about the displays, the Galaxy Z Fold 5 does have a 6.7 inch display diagonally on the front cover and then a 7.6 inch diagonally on the inside. It does have a dynamic AMOLED 1440p 120 hertz, the typical Samsung specs for a display. The newest thing, the latest thing with these displays is that they both now have a peak brightness of 1750 nits. So I think it's pretty much the same as the Z4 or the Galaxy S23 Ultra. So the experience when you're outdoors it's improved. It's much better now. It's definitely easier to see the display. Not that it was terrible before, but definitely an improvement for sure. You also now have the ability to use the enhanced eye comfort shield on both the inside and the outside, which basically helps reduce the blue light and adapts it to your environment that you're in, depending on what kind of light environment you're in. And it's pretty nice. It does reduce the saturation and vibrancy of the display. So you may like that or not. Maybe something you want to turn on in the afternoon or at night, but I personally like to have it on at all times. It just it looks okay to me. It's fine. But overall, the displays, the front cover and the inside screen are beautiful displays. They're Samsung displays. They're what you expect. They're gorgeous. They're bright, colorful, rich in color. It just look good overall. They're also, like I said, OLED. So in my opinion, displays as far as quality, they're not going to be disappointed. They're also very smooth because of the 120 hertz adaptive refresh rate. But as far as the experience though, using the devices in hand, it's a bit odd only because you have to adjust to the whole foldable experience because you may be coming from a slap phone. So if you're used to just having one display for everything that you do, you do kind of have to learn how to adjust to the dual display system here. So for me, I use the front cover display when I'm using one app at a time for the most part. Sometimes I'll split screen where I'll watch YouTube at the top and then browse something else at the bottom or I'll use picture in picture. But for the most part, the front cover display is great for just browsing social media real quick, looking at a text or responding to a text or searching YouTube and then also maybe switching up a song and Spotify and stuff like that. So it's great for like one handed usage and apps that just require you to swipe. It's perfect for that in my opinion. And most apps nowadays have been somewhat optimized for this narrow display. There's some apps that may have black bars at the top and the bottom, but I've run into very little apps nowadays. Beforehand, when I first had my Z Fold 3, there's a lot of apps that had a lot of black bars. But nowadays, the apps do a decent job adjusting to the co their content to fit this type of screen. So most of the time you don't lose too much content, um, but there may be some apps where you may lose some content. The only bad thing about this display is typing. Like I said, you can respond to text on here, but it may be best to just use the swipe gestures because using two hands on the front cover display is, is quite a bit tight, especially if you have big fat thumbs like I do. The front cover display is also flat, so there's no waterfall displays or anything like that, no curved edges. So it is easy to attach a screen printer if you want to. I have a plastic one attached currently, but you can easily install a tempered glass one. Now talking about the inside display, the experience on here is phenomenal. So whatever you don't do on your cover display, you're likely going to want to do on the inside display. And pretty much everything you do on the cover display can also be done on the inner display if you wanted to. But it may be a bit of a different experience and it may be a bit of an odd experience. So again, typing and texting can be a bit weird just because you do or you may want to use a, a split keyboard instead of a full size keyboard. Again, you can maybe move that keyboard to one side or use a floating keyboard or just use swipe gestures and stuff like that. So typing in my opinion overall is a bit rough on the Z Fold 5 overall, but you definitely get used to it over time. The display is a flex display. So it does from sides and angles have a bit of a plastic and warpy look to it in my opinion. Um, but overall, you're gonna be using the phone face on and straight on. So it really isn't going to bother you too much. And you can see the crease 
it's again something that may or may not bother you i definitely got used to it after some time after using a fold for over two years now i got used to it but if you're new to it you're definitely going to notice that at first and once you get adjusted to it give it a week or two you'll be fine same thing with the under display camera that's something i completely forgot about for the longest time that it was there Again, you notice it at first when you're looking for it, especially when you have your display on a like a white background, it has a bit of a pixelated rainbowish look to it. Like you can clearly see that it's there, but once you start using the phone, you're not gonna notice it anymore. The under display is also compatible with an S Pen. You do have to use a Z Fold Edition S Pen, so you can't use like your tablet S Pens or your S23 Ultra S Pens. It does have to be a specific S Pen. And it's a decent experience depending on like the kind of person you are. If you're a drawer, or like an artist, I feel like this might be a bit of too small of a display still. If you're taking quick notes, maybe it's fine. Um, but for the most part, I don't really use my S Pen. It's there and I don't really use it. The last thing I wanna know is that the built-in screen protector that comes pre-installed has been peeling off a little bit at the very top edge. Hasn't been growing, which is good, but that's something to keep in mind that people over time tend to notice or tend to experience that, that screen protector start to peel off, whether it be on the edges or sides or down the crease in the middle. I've experienced that myself with previous folds. Another thing too is that because there is a screen protector, dust does build up on the edges there. So you do have to make sure that you wipe it down and clean it up quite a bit. Um, and dust also just attracts itself to the inner display for some reason because I guess how plasticky and sticky it is sometimes it does have to be constantly wiped down. So that's something to keep in mind as well for the Z Fold 5's inner display. Next, let's talk about biometrics. So the Z Fold 5 does have a built-in fingerprint sensor on the power button. So it is a physical fingerprint sensor. So it's relatively fast and relatively reliable. So I've had little to no issues with it. So it works pretty much fast and easy. And you do have the option of turning it on or having it set to always be on. So as soon as it detects there's a finger on it, it automatically detects if it's your finger. So I think it's pretty convenient and you can have it set so that it's either turned on all the time when it's folded or once you open it, that feature turns off. So you can really decide how you wanna customize that before it was either always on or either always off. One thing I do wanna know is that when you're setting your fingerprint up, you do have to have the phone folded open which is kind of weird because with my left hand, since I'm mostly right-handed, I mostly use my right hand and I use my thumb on my right hand to unlock it. With my left hand, I end up using my middle finger. So I have to stretch across to unlock it. So it's weird because when you have to set it up, you can't have the phone folded closed. So when I'm setting it up, it, I have to kind of finesse it. So it's almost like if I had the phone closed, but not quite because otherwise it'll cancel it and interrupt it. So I wish they would allow me to set it up so that I can have the phone closed and set up my fingerprint that way. And when I'm actually using it, there's a lot of times with my middle finger where it doesn't recognize it. Just because I think the way when I'm setting it up, it's not the same exact position as if it was closed. And you also have facial recognition available both on the cover display and also on the inner display. So whichever one you pick to choose or however you have it open and, and turn it on, it should be able to recognize you on both displays. And it works relatively okay. It's not the most reliable and most uh, secure, but it gets the job done in my opinion. It won't work if you're in a very low light environment or if your phone's like very far away from you or at a different angle, at a weird angle, it may not recognize you, but for the most part, it does the job and it gets it done. And you can also decide if you want the lock screen to be bypassed as soon as it recognizes your face or to stay on the lock screen. You can also have it so that once it recognizes your face and it stays on the lock screen, your notifications can stay hidden or I guess the details of it can stay locked. And once it sees your face, and unlocks them and shows you the actual details. And one thing I forgot to mention with the fingerprint sensor, before with other previous folds, they had this gesture feature that allowed you to swipe down on the fingerprint sensor to bring down your notifications. They no longer have that. I don't know if they changed the physical fingerprint sensor itself or if they just removed it from the software. So I miss it a little bit, but I have adapted to it by using the good lock feature now where you can swipe down from the left-hand side or double tap the back of the device to be able to get into those notifications. So. I do still miss it though, and that's something if you didn't know, it's gone now. And the phone is IPX8 water resistant rated, so that means that it can withstand water. So if you splash water at it, or if you accidentally drop it in water, it should survive and be just fine. But if you drop it in dust and sand or dirt, there's a chance that you may either get stuff stuck within the hinge, or if you close the device, the display with stuff within it, yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of screwed maybe. So definitely be careful around dust particles and sand and stuff like that. But with water, just chuck it into water. It doesn't matter. Now, as far as performance, you do have the latest hits and specs with the Z Fold 5, Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, 
12 gigabytes of RAM. I believe it's LPDDR5X RAM. UFS 4.0 storage starting at 256 up to a terabyte. I personally have 512. Then you have the Adreno 740 GPU. What does all that mean? Basically, flagship specs, and you're going to be having a phenomenal experience, in my opinion. From day one to the day, I don't remember a day where the phone either was overheating, lagged, or all the bad negative cons that you can think of. I think this phone has been running tremendously well, super smooth when you're just browsing around, even within apps. For the most part, it runs really well as well. There's some apps that may have a delay here and there, and when you're swiping home, maybe a hiccup every now and then, but honestly, never noticeable because it happens so quick if there's ever a skip in a frame or something that you honestly won't even notice it. In some games, I did notice a bit of a frame drop here and there. Again, I am trying to push sometimes the settings to try and get the best quality settings on in some of the games. So, for example, Minecraft, there's a couple of times where I was uh, increasing the rendering. I think the distance rendering. I don't know what the heck it was. But either way, I, I noticed a couple frame rates to skip every now and then. But honestly, still, the gameplay was still phenomenal. It was still what I expected it to be. And I'm running it on a big display as well compared to just a regular slab phone. So... I am personally very satisfied with the performance on the Z Flip 5. Don't have much to complain about and rave about, honestly. Uh, it's just a super reliable phone so far. And the only time I ever felt the phone getting hot was when I actually filmed a video with the Z Flip 5 in 8K. And the phone was pretty warm. It was, I would say it's hot. But it wasn't like super hot to the point that it, I couldn't touch it or anything like that. I just stopped recording. And after some time, it started to cool down. So for me... The performance has been consistent and pretty good overall. Now, as far as the software, it is Android and it's also running Samsung's One UI 5.1.1, I think it's the latest one as of the recording of this video. I'm not sure when One UI 6 is gonna come out, but whenever that comes out, I'll be excited for it. But either way, with this latest version of One UI, it pretty much gives you the same experience that all other Samsung devices get, plus a little bit more extra because it's affordable. So with the lock screen, you have the basics, customize your clock style, customize your quick app launches and the way the notifications show up and stuff like that. It's very simple customization. You can change the filters for the wallpaper as well. And you can also add like a contact info in case you lose your device. And then moving on to the home screen, you get the usual Android stuff, be able to move apps anywhere. And now you have the ability to also put widgets together to be able to scroll through them. So you have scrollable widgets or stackable widgets, however you want to call it. So you get the basic stuff for Android. And the biggest thing to know about is that you have the option of either mirroring your home screen setup or you can have a different home screen setup on your cover display and also on the inner display. So I personally recommend that so that you can customize your home screen on your cover display to be set up with apps that you would typically use on your cover screen and then on your inner display, set it up with apps that you would typically want to use on the inner display. If you're new to foldables, you may wanna use the mirror because that way it's easier to learn and adapt. And once you figure out your habits, you can then set up those separate home screens. And then swiping down, you do have your notifications and you also have access to your quick settings, which for the most part right now, they work the same as other devices. So notifications show up in groups if there's the same thread or if there's the same type of notification or if it's like a sporting event, all those specific notifications for that event will be grouped in one notification. All social media messages that you receive will be placed at the top so that you don't get them lost within your notifications. With your quick settings, you have access to a bunch of different stuff. You also have access to your device controls and media output, which I think is an unsung hero because I don't know how many times I accidentally connect to a Bluetooth device and I realize it's playing on the wrong device. So I have to quickly change or sometimes people will just turn off Bluetooth. That's what my parents do at least. Um, but with device controls, just click on it and select which device you want the, the audio to come out from. Both the quick settings is pretty simple. You just toggle it on and off, hold down to go to the actual settings of that quick setting, or you can actually click the name of that quick setting to open up like a mini menu. It either gives you a little bit of information about what that quick setting is, or it gives you extra options. You also have the option of turning on the Google Discover page, which I barely ever use, honestly. I kind of want to turn it off because it's kind of a waste. <laughs> I don't really use it. You also have your app drawer, which I personally love the way Samsung lets you control your app drawer. Basically, it allows you to customize it how you want. So you can move apps into folders or you can move apps into separate pages. So a page can be something specific. Like for me, example, is I have one page with all my Samsung apps, another page of all the Google apps, and another page of all my other apps. So it makes it very convenient to customize my app drawer. 
So now let's look at the ecosystem stuff, that being the Google ecosystem or the Samsung ecosystem. So with the Google ecosystem, you have stuff like Google Messages, Google's Find My, Google's Nearby Share, all integrated into the Z Fold 5. Then you also have Samsung's ecosystem, which allows you to auto connect with other devices within your Samsung account. So if you have Samsung tablets or another Samsung phone, you have, you have Samsung earbuds, it makes it pretty easy to connect to all those devices. I think also Samsung laptops, if you have a laptop. So basically the one thing you can do is also do quick sharing. So that's basically the same thing as nearby share with Google, but this is within Samsung devices. You can also continue within Samsung devices. So basically you can copy something from one Samsung device. It'll save it to the clipboard and it'll be like a universal clipboard and then you can paste that into another Samsung device. So this could be easy and convenient for like copying a link, copying notes, copying a photo. It's pretty cool. You also have auto connect with your Galaxy Buds. So if you have two, again, Samsung devices and you're listening to audio on one device, so say you're watching a YouTube video on your tablet and then you start listening to music on your phone, it'll automatically connect to that device so you don't have to go into the Bluetooth settings and switch between them. It's super convenient and super easy. And with text and calling, you have the option of using Samsung's text and calling, which allows you to receive calls on your phone and then receive them also on your tablets. You can also connect via Google Messages. So if you wanna just connect your messages, just scan the QR code for your Google Messages app on your tablet and you'll be able to connect to them easily. So now let's go over some other notable Samsung features that you may wanna know about. One is Samsung's Bixby call and text basically allows you to have Bixby answer the phone for you and you can just see what that person is saying on the other line and then you can type out what you want to say or what you want Bixby to say to that user. So it's convenient for if there's ever those times where you can't actually answer the phone call or if you don't want to talk to this person or talk to whoever it is that's calling you, just have Bixby talk to them and then you just type out what you want to say. It's pretty cool and it's a little bit weirder um, compared to Google's version because with Google, you have these prompts. And with Bixby, you actually type out what you want to say. So you can get very naughty or you can get you know, foul if you wanted to. Samsung also has their secure folder, which basically allows you to hide either specific apps or specific files and media if you wanted to within this secure folder. And then you can customize the icon of the secure folder to be something else so that people don't know that you have a secure folder. You have something called Samsung Dex, which you may or may not have heard of, but basically, it allows you to convert your phone or turn your phone into a desktop PC, essentially. So you plug your phone into a display or connect via wireless, and you're able to get this like unique UI experience that gives you pretty much a Chrome slash Windows-like experience. So you can browse your phone like if it was a computer, but personally, I don't really use it. I've never been in a situation where I needed to do that. So maybe someday I'll be in, in a pinch or an experience where I needed to do that. But personally, as of now, I don't really use it. So lastly, let's talk about the foldable, somewhat foldable, exclusive experiences. So first one is gonna be multitasking. God is not only this phone super powerful enough to handle multitasking, but the software experience just makes it so much better. So first off, you can use split screen. And when I mean split screen, I mean three-way split screening if you wanted to. So you can have one app running on both sides or top and bottom, however you wanna split it up, two full apps. That's amazing. So you can watch a YouTube video, play a game, browse through social media apps, browse the calculator app, do all kinds of different stuff. There's a ton of ways you can be productive with split screen. And then on top of that, you're able to use something called floating windows. So this allows you to bring over an app and pop it up, have it float over top of everything else that you're doing, whether it be already split screening or already just using one app and full screen and just have this floating window so you can be watching another video, uh, taking a look at stocks or whatever the heck you want to do, you can have these floating windows. I personally don't use floating windows too much, but it's there if you want to use it. You also have just picture in picture in general. So you can have this video just floating around in its own little window as you do something else, either again, split screening, have floating windows and picture in picture. You can really get crazy with the multitasking on a Z Fold 5. The next thing is flex mode. So flex mode basically allows you to fold your device in a way where it basically becomes its own little kickstand. 
So the bottom half of the display will have a couple of different settings depending on the app that you're in. Most media apps, so or streaming apps I should say, will go into this media type of flex mode which basically allows you to control the playback, you can skip forward, you can control the brightness, and if you go into like the internet, you have the ability to turn this into a trackpad. I think actually most apps, uh, when you go into flex mode, you can have this turn into a trackpad, so it's almost like you have a mini computer. It's very cool. It's very convenient for when you're watching a video though. That's the biggest thing in my opinion. So say you're watching a video in full screen, you're walking with it or something, and then you get to a table. You just put it in flex mode and that's it. Before, you would probably have to try and prop your phone up with something, or if you have one of those cases that has a kickstand and whatever, you know, UBU. But if you don't have those cases, or if you don't have something to prop your phone up, just use flex mode. It's super convenient and super cool in my opinion. And lastly, software support and software updates. You'll be getting four years of major OS updates and then five years of security updates with the Z Flip 5. So you're good until what, 2023? So all the way to 2027 or 2028, you're set, you're set my guy. Now, software may last, but the hardware is always the biggest question. So that's always something to keep in mind as well. And as far as how consistent you're updating the device, I think I've gotten at least two updates, at least, I think two, yeah, two updates of the Z Fold 5 since it's released. So there you go. So next, let's talk about these cameras. They haven't really changed much as far as hardware. And I'm gonna try something different with the cameras this time around, because I always feel like when I talk about cameras, I feel like I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I always feel like I'm just saying random stuff and hoping it sticks or hoping it makes sense. And I feel like that's not really helpful. What I'm gonna do is just, right now I'm telling you right now, the Z Fold 5 cameras are great. They're great for what they offer. You're not gonna be getting a bad experience as far as cameras. You do have five different cameras. You have your front cover display camera, your back cameras, which is a ultra wide, a regular wide, and then a telephoto. And then you have your under display camera on the inner display. So all what I'm gonna do is just put up samples for you guys and let you decide whether or not these cameras, the quality that, that's producing is good for you. So I'll do photos and I'll do videos and I may do some other random settings for videos and stuff like that. So I'll just put in the description or I'll just put like on, on the screen, I'll stamp it with what it is that you're seeing. So hopefully that's more helpful than me just trying to pretend that I know what I'm talking about. So let me know what you think of the cameras down in the comments.
Lastly, battery life. You can't have a great phone that performs well, provides lots of features, if the battery is bad. So the battery life for me has been, I would say, overall really good. So I've been getting anywhere from maybe at the minimum 12 hours to a day, sometimes a day and a half of battery life. All depends on what I do that day or what I'm putting it up against and how long I'm using it for. So everyone's mileage is always going to vary here. But for me, I mostly just browse social media, maybe like Reddit, watch YouTube videos, the internet, maybe check a couple of other apps here and there. But for the most part, it's very basic usage. So I get anywhere from a minimum of two hours to four or five hours screen on time. Again, depends on the day. So for me, battery life has been nothing but good to me with the Z Fold 5. As far as the charging speeds, you do have 25 watts of wire charging and then 15 watts of wireless charging. I don't really use wireless charging that much, but it's there if you want to use it. You also have reverse wireless charging as well. But with the wire charging, it takes about 
I think maybe an hour and 15 or 20 minutes. So it's not improved from last year. There's no 45 watts charging. I, I think that's definitely something that they're missing with the Z Fold 5 because the S23 Ultra has that. They got to bump it up to 45 sometime. I don't know what they got to do with the battery on the inside. I'm sure it has to do with the technology that they're using or because it's affordable and stuff like that. They don't want to make it too hot when it's charging. Um, so I hope to see that as an improvement sometime. Maybe the Fold 6? I guess we'll find out. So there you have it. That's the Galaxy Z Fold 5 after about two months or so of usage. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think of the Z Fold 5. Is it a phone that you're considering or if you're upgrading from a previous old Z Fold? I actually think that if you're coming from a Z Fold 3 or older, it may be worth the jump, especially just because you're getting a boost in those like specs and performance. It may be worth it. But other than that, if you have the Z Fold 4, I'd wait it out one more year. I personally think it's not big enough of an upgrade maybe just the, the specs, but besides that, I think it's worth waiting one more year. If you're coming from a regular slab phone, unless you're strapped with cash, again, depends on the phone that you have right now, but unless you're strapped with cash, I would also consider maybe getting a Z Fold 4. And the reason I say that is because not everyone's gonna have a fantastic experience with affordable, because you may be new to it. And if you're new to it, you may not like that experience. So consider getting a Z Fold 4 first or a Z Fold 3 even, try it out for a bit. And if you have the ability to return it or actually make sure you have the ability to return it because if you can return it and then commit to the Z Fold 5. Because otherwise I, I, I would hate for someone to commit to the Z Fold 5 just because it's a very good phone because it is a good phone and then not like the experience because of the affordable experience. So definitely keep that in mind. But with that being said, the Z Fold 5, fantastic phone in my opinion. It's overall a good package, but it really depends on what you're coming from, whether or not you should get it. So with that being said, hope you guys enjoyed. Peace.